women who I've spoken to really stress that what they would like is safe migration policies. You know, it's, it's not about sex work. It's not about what's happening in the brothel or in the karaoke bar. It's about um, the conditions that underlie their, their journeys. Um, so I think unless policy starts to, to look at that and unless NGOs, NGOs need to also turn to that, but it's not a sexy thing to look at, right? And it's hard to get donor support for that kind of, um, that type and that type of difficult and nuanced and complex intervention. But that's really what the women who I've spoken to or listened to want. Great, um, I'm gonna to try to cover three of the questions, um, condoms of evidence, Christoph, and then the question about the documentary. The documentary. Um, uh, Nicholas Christoph, I mean, he is a huge uh, cultural icon. One of the uh, quotes I didn't get a chance to read, um, I think illustrates the ways, uh, one of the problems that I have with him, I have many problems with Nicholas Christoph, <laughs> so many problems with him, um, but one is that he uh, seems completely oblivious of his own complicity in terms of uh, his own white male privilege. And, and how that kind of re reaffirms um, a, a, a prob very problematic kind of dominant um, personality when it comes to talking about others. So here's a quote. He says, and this is why we should uh, take up this abolition, abolitionist um, a campaign against prostitution worldwide. We're not arguing that Westerners should take up this cause because it's the fault of the West. Western men do not play a central role in the prostitution in most poor countries. The vast majority are local men brown men, those other men. Um, so this is not a case where we in the West have a responsibility to lead because we're the source of the problem. Uh, rather, we single out West, the West because even though we're peripheral to the slavery, <coughs> our action is necessary to overcome a horrific evil. So, I mean, if you know anything about global economic structuring, <laughs> if you know anything about the history of slavery, you know, where is he coming from? Is this completely, um, it, it, I'm just baffled by those sorts of quotes from him. He also seems to completely disregard uh, the need for valid uh, data. He says, oh yeah, we, we sort of stretch the truth, but you know, the point <laughs> is that there are victims that we need to rescue. That doesn't, I mean, that's just, that doesn't buy it if you're, if you're a sociologist interested or people interested in actually looking for valid data. Um, so that's the Christoph thing. In terms of condoms of evidence, um, I'm absolutely uh, in favor of, of addressing this um, this injustice of uh, police officers being able to use condoms as, as evidence of, of being a criminal, in other words, being a, a sex worker. I mean, this is, I think, a great illustration of how these sorts of anti-prostitution campaigns have nothing to do with sexual health, have nothing to do with sexual rights, have nothing to do with women's rights in that kind of basic sense. I mean, that's like a really important kind of piece of evidence for that. Um, and then um, about the docu documentary, there's so many documentaries like this. When I, I've been teaching a course on um, commercial sex work and global human rights for about 10 years at the University of Washington. And um, around 2002, 2003, I started getting these students coming in and telling me about these documentaries that they were watching. What, have you seen this documentary? Have you seen this documentary? No, I haven't seen that documentary. Who, who's the producer? Were they an academic? No. Who are they? Anyway. Um, and they would come, up, come in with these stories of truth. Well. Um, the bottom line is that there are true stories of bad things that happen. There are all kinds of bad things that happen around the world. And what I'm trying to do here, at least with this presentation, is to think about critically, uh, let's think about what are our options here to address bad things. Bad things happen to kids all the time. I'm very concerned about that too. Uh, it's the only option to say, oh, the police officers are the ones who are going to take control of this. I think that that's highly problematic and that we have to think about this in terms of a, a larger state where we assume that the police um, are the ones who are now going to be social workers, now are going to be teachers, they're now going to be essentially parents, and they're going to take care of everyone. There's all sorts of problems with that kind of model. Um, and so the bad things happen, and there are more than, more than one model in terms of cracking down on those bad things, um, and then furthermore, when you when you start to label, uh, when we start to label uh, underage sex workers as trafficking victims rather than teenage prostitutes, this has all uh, many other kind of ripple effects, as do their friends and family who are no longer identified as pimps, but now they're traffickers. The first anti-trafficking, the first trafficking case in Washington State, um, successfully prosecuted. Uh, was against a trafficker who was a 19-year-old black male pimp. And now, he, you know, had he been arrested for pimping before this law, 
he would have gotten what a few I don't even know what what the what the t what this term would be. He's arrested after the law, and now suddenly he's in prison for a really long time. Is that something that we need to do in terms of being social justice activists and thinking about the prison industrial complex? I have a very I know that, I think that's highly problematic. May I just address one more thing about Kristoff? And this comes from a sex worker's perspective. Many of us have had clients like Kristoff. They have a white savior fantasy. They pay big money for it, but they don't end up harming us. Christoph's sexual fantasy is that he's going to rescue us poor whores, and he's going to make sure that we all become good Christian girls. And that's, it's a very sick fantasy for him, and I wish he would go out and get laid once in a while and stop having this fantasy that destroys the lives of so many women. Okay, I'm opening up to this side, this table, and this table, if you guys have questions here. Yes, please. or the sex work underground because there was challenges to the way that they had like a lot of taxes or other things and then also there was increased complaints from sex workers that there was violence and then there was also increased trafficking related with the demand and so there was a lot of challenges associated with the the, the lift of the ban on brothels and so I I hear this sex worker rights conversation but I didn't at least when I studied that model I was like that didn't seem to be effective so I'm wondering you know, if there's a model you've seen that seems to avoid conflating sex work and trafficking, and if there is, if you could describe it, and also if you have like a vision of, you know, what would be effective at, you know, not conflating the two and effectively addressing the concerns of victims and reducing the demand for trafficking while still respecting the rights mm -hmm. of sex workers. And I feel like I haven't been able to hear a good narrative on that or effective evidence of a system that works. So I either, if you have a system that works that you could talk about, or there's one that you could envision if you could tell us about that. Other questions and comments on this side of the room? Yeah. Um, my question is in education, you know, the having a more feminist approach as the, 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 the girls grow up, you know, I don't know what the system is in Vietnam and Thailand and, you know, I'm a Filipino American and I know our culture is highly macho as well. So I'm saying are there efforts to even boost up the girls, their self-esteem while the in, 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 in grade schools. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where a change, a more feminist approach to the culture should be one of the solutions. And I don't know what you think of that. Um, Alan? Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that interests me a lot in this discussion is the relationship between feminism and trafficking. And if you look at the history of the second wave, um, I think it's fair to say that there was a certain strand of especially radical feminism that became really interested and concerned with uh, prostitution and tried to actually talk about how prostitution might be eliminated with uh, a total lack of success because the very first, I think, conference that was held, this would, would have been in the early 70s, became um, <laughs> a cost of love for actual prostitutes who showed up and said, hello, you know, you might have thought before you organized this conference about including us yeah. in this discussion, right? And so I think members of Coyote Call Off Your Old Tired Ethics, which was a group of uh, of prostitutes, organized prostitutes, uh, led by Margot St. James, um, basically just shut that conference down, you know? I mean, it was really a very contentious um, scene. And what happened as a result, at least as I tried to reconstruct the history, is that a lot of those feminists then became involved, it was like, okay, prostitution is too hot because there are actual women there who are going to give us a lot of crap. Okay, so they moved on to pornography, right. and a, and you know, mm -hmm. at first it seemed as though that was actually going to be the movement that succeeded in bringing women across lines of class and race mm -hmm. together, because it seemed as though 
This was something that all women would be equally concerned about, this proliferation of pornography. Well, it turned out that pornography proved to be pretty darn explosive as well. And uh, you know, there were huge battles that within the feminist movement we called the sex wars, you know, between feminists about how you deal with pornography. And one of the things that happened was that a lot of the women who were involved in trying to eliminate pornography were not able to succeed on at the domestic level. They failed in the city of Indianapolis, they failed in the city of Minneapolis. And some of those people then migrated into working at the UN, as I understand it, and became involved and actually became architects of this sort of new framework of trafficking. That's my take on it, but I want to hear from you guys um, um, the extent to which that corresponds or doesn't to your understanding of what happened. Because clearly feminism plays some role in the fact that you know people were not talking about trafficking not very long ago, just a few decades ago. Um, that was a relic of a you know of an earlier sort of feminist past, and it's been revived. And feminism clear or a strand of feminism, because there were quite a few feminists who certainly um, opposed this and have opposed it. So I'd love to hear from you guys about this. Great. I, ha I have this woman right here, this gentleman right here, and then we're going to come back to the panel. Yes, um, I wanted to know, I've done some research on mail order brides, and I wanted, to, my question is, because all of you have talked about empowerment of the victims and uh, made the distinction be between consensual prostitution or consensual sex workers and um, the illegal sex workers that are coerced into the industry. And my <coughs> issue with mail order brides, I guess, is that like you said, Kimberly, that um, a lot of these women seek economic opportunities, equal pay, um, and they don't have that, and so they're looking for other industries where they can make a mark and get out of where, they're, where they came from. And so even though they consent to this process of being a bride, um, does that mean that um, they, um, don't have a right then to claim that they're victimized by their husbands for economic abuse, physical abuse, et cetera. Like um, you, um, Norma, <coughs> just mentioned about the judge saying that prostitutes cannot be raped. So I, I, I just don't understand the concept how that is legal, but then they don't have a voice. And it's like, well, that's her fault, kind of. Um, well, I'm moving in two directions here. I mean, you know, this is a conference on trafficking, which, um, as the keynote speaker said, um, you should all avoid anti-traffickers as much as possible. <laughs> and what if that direction? And, um, I um, plus the fact that I do think um, that the trafficking movement, for all its problems, which we've raised here, um, has been an ex enormously important one, and has um, raised. Um, um, concern and activism about a vast number of people who are indeed um, um, oppressed. Um, I guess the important distinction which should make clear, and I talk about this later on, is between, say, prostitutes who are free agents, and one recognizes that, as um, a sociology colleague Ben Katesh has so clearly shown in the story of Chicago, and those who are genuinely enslaved. And I mean, this, the problem is failing to make that distinction and the attempt by the abolitionists to conflate all forms of prostitutes. I, I think that's wrong. But, um, but I think we have to be careful not to, I mean, there are Nepalese women who are trafficked and this is a death sentence. They all end up with AIDS and die within three, four years and we're talking about thousands and thousands. And so we, we, we must be careful as we recognize the need to recognize agency and the fact that there are women who independently choose to be prostitutes, get in of it, get out of it when they choose to. That we, 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 we don't sort of um, underplay the very important um, role here. But actually, I want to go to the other end, and there's a question for, for Kimberly. And um, the, um, <laughs> you emphasize the role of entrepreneurship um, there, um, which is exercised by these women. And um, as we were talking about earlier, I know cases in the Caribbean where this is so. But what I'm intrigued by was, um, is Elizabeth Bernstein's book, Study. Um, temporarily ours, 
who is coming at this from another angle, suggesting that globalization, the new economy, has sort of created a new need for a new form of eroticism in which women are providing, in fact, and responding to this uh, wholly new uh, kind of um, sexual uh, need. And, um, and um, I wonder um, how you'd fit in your own work in, um, in, in Vietnam with this um, development, because it seems to me that quite apart from their entrepreneurship, um, and I had the pleasure of reading your thesis, is, um, is that they also seem to be doing something like what uh, Bernstein is suggesting, this, um, this new space uh, which is being created, um, and, uh, which gets us back to recognizing, in fact, that um, prostitution is not just sort of victimization. Yeah. We'll go down the road again. How about if we try mix things up and go down this way? There you okay. go. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. I guess um, I can start with the, the male order bride um, issue. Um, I know this is a, is a very common term, and uh, a lot of my students also um, study this and, and want to write papers about it. But I, 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 again, I'm, I'm really a stickler around how we label things and how we frame things. I think that the labeling of a male order bride is a, is, 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 a, is a demeaning and condescending label. I think it's objectifying, <coughs> it erases already uh, any kind of agency that goes into it. Um, it's, she's not a package being mailed, she's a person deciding to make an economic choice and travel across boundaries. So that's my first point. Um, and I think that um, this the second point can maybe connect to many of the comments or questions um, about the Netherlands. I mean, Think about that for a second. Um, if, if you know, the Netherlands, even though there's, there's, you know, it's legal, uh, there are still uh, exploitative situations. We have <coughs> situations uh, even here in the United States in legal industries. Um, and if we were to think about uh, uh, this, and this is not a new argument; it's a very old argument that comes from the sex labor rights movement. Think about sex work as work. Then uh, we could just sort of think about this as another form of another domain in which we can think about um, ranges of coercion and exploitation. Um, the, the early uh, uh, second wave feminist movement was very much focused on uh, uh, domestic violence. Domestic violence is a, is a, a, a big part of many um, consensual legal marriages. Um, when we find issues or incidences of domestic violence exploitation, uh, terrible living conditions. We don't, nobody is, except for maybe a very few, uh, try to abolish the, the institution of marriage, right? So, um, so of course, think about abuse, think about exploitation, think about coercion, but what, what does it do? What work does it do to make it a separate category around sexuality? Why not put it all within the realm of humanity? Uh, many people who work as sex workers are also mothers and wives. Many people also are working at uh, other industries um, simultaneously to make ends meet. Why do we need to make this separate category just for sex work? I think that it's it's serving other state uh, needs that are not in the interests of uh, people, humans, trying to make their, their lives better. So I'll address this issue of the, the sort of feminist approach to looking at anti-trafficking policy or, or sex work. Um, and I, I think, Alice, your, your comments. Um, I just can't see you. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, out of that, um, so there were two sort of camps, right, that, that uh, developed during the, the culture wars era. Um, around pornography and, and, and prostitution, right? So there were feminist um, scholars like Catherine McKinnon who said, you know, all uh, prostitution all is uh, exploitative. And then you have other scholars and, and feminist uh, activists who argue that uh, sex work can be consensual and empowering. And I do think that this argument has been exported uh, abroad. So, you know, um, in a sense, that war was lost uh, here because of free, because of the free speech, right? So um, it was it has been exported abroad, and that is what you see being reinforced in a lot of the NGOs and a lot of the, the policies abroad. Um, I, I guess you know again going back to this idea of um, the privilege of the West and the privilege of 
not just the Western hero, like Chris, the Christophe uh, critique, but also the, the white Western feminist, right? So it's, it's, again, another way of kind of reinforcing that trope of normalizing <coughs> Um, Western feminism, Western, um, certain types of Western scholarship, right, when research is being done on this, in this, in this area, and this is a big um, issue within feminist inter international relations as well, sort of how is research conducted, you know, whose values, whose morals, whose, um, whose standards, whose judgments are being privileged when we do research, even as feminists. So it gets very, it gets very complex. Um, but also to your question about, um, you know, sort of what is the answer, what, what would a feminist approach look like kind of on the ground, and should we be raising girls' self-esteem and so forth. I really think, personally, that a, a feminist approach doesn't put the onus on girls to have their self-esteem raised. Mm -hmm. I think that a feminist approach would instead look at how we can empower or how communities can empower themselves. Um, a feminist approach would look at the structural conditions that underlie migration such as poverty, um, warfare, you know, uh, an example being what's going on in Burma right now, uh, the ethnic minority conflict in Kachin State uh, and the militarized Burmese government is fueling trafficking and consensual migration into Thailand. Well, what is our role in that? You know, what, what, what is the U.S. doing to, to help those communities? Is people, you know, are, are we doing anything? to empower those communities. So again, rather than taking, taking, rather than putting all of the emphasis and the onus on a girl and her choices, and is she making a good choice or a bad choice for herself, um, I think a feminist approach would take a much holistic perspective. Mm -hmm. I think that's great that they answered those two questions, those questions over here, so I'll just move over here. <laughs> um, so to answer your question about male, male order brides, I actually have an article that's forthcoming in spring 2013, this spring, um, uh, called Transnational Gender Vertigo. And it follows, so I study 263 clients and workers, but it follows 24 individuals, 12 couples who have successfully married and migrated to the United States. And of the group that I talked about, these are women catering to Western men that I gave mo most of my talk on today. And what I found actually in visiting them in their destination sites, you know, in various parts of Europe and Australia and the United States is that actually they become the primary breadwinner because they're working primarily in ethnic enclaves, in nail salons, um, in, you know, ethnic grocery stores and so on, in the informal economy to remit money back to Vietnam. And in the process, because of the financial crisis and the age gap between them and their husbands, they become the primary breadwinner also in the US. And also I would say that it's interesting that I've only been able to follow 12 couples because Vietnam has the, one of the highest rates of fraudulent marriages for many reasons. And then with the whole anti-trafficking campaign has curbed a lot of the visas that people could get to migrate abroad, K visas through ma marriage and, and migration. And so of those 12 couples, it's, it's extremely difficult to marry and migrate, particularly to the West. You see more women moving to other various parts of Asia. Um, but because of that, the financial crisis happened, and then many of the men lost their retirement and are living primarily on Social Security. And so because of that, women are working, and it traces sort of their lives for three or four years. The marriage and migration process takes two to three years. Mm -hmm. And I, what I found, interestingly enough, is that in the process, most of them sort of fall in love with each other. Because, they're, because once the women migrate to the US, they're so isolated, yeah. even mm -hmm. from the community within their ethnic enclaves because they're married to older white men and are automatically marked as sex workers. And <coughs> have this sort of social stigma that makes them, in many ways, bond with their husbands. And so it's a complicated relationship, and that's, that's, that's to answer your question there. Um, to answer your question about sort of women as shrewd entrepreneurs, the larger book project that I'm doing looks at four markets, and I think it's important to look at different segments of a market. It's not just poor women on the street, but it, you know, the, the market is highly stratified. And so the high-end market that I look at caters to wealthy Vietnamese businessmen and Asian businessmen. And the market below that caters to overseas Vietnamese men and Western businessmen. Well, after the finance, so Vietnam joined the World Trade Organization in 2006. And after the financial crisis in 2008, a ton of foreign direct investment was being dumped into <laughs> Vietnam. 
So you go from having $3 billion of, of dispersed capital in FDI to $12 billion of dispersed foreign direct investment into Vietnam. That's a huge amount over one, two, three years, right, from 2008, 9, 10, 11. And what happened is the committed capital in 2008, right at the financial crisis in 2008, peaked at $71 billion. What that means is that it shifted the hierarchical stratification of the sex industry because most of the foreign direct investment was coming from Asia. And so what that means when I say that women are shrewd entrepreneurs in the larger book project is that you can't do business in Asia without involving the sex industry. So much of what was going on in Vietnam revolved around land development projects, which involve a great deal of speculation. The same thing was happening in the United States, except for in Vietnam, much of the way in which Asians do business with each other, um, South Koreans, Taiwanese, Malaysians, Singaporeans, is that they bypass a lot of the bureaucratic hoops that one would normally have to go through. They don't involve international lawyers. They do a lot of things that one would could arguably say are following, you know, are aligned with foreign corrupt pra the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Mm -hmm. but, and so what's essential though, and I, I actually don't think, I don't frame these kinds of transactions as corrupt practices actually. I think it's something that happens in rapidly developing economies when you have that much, that kind of, uh, that, that sort of rapid injection of foreign direct investment coming into the country. What I argue is that the sex industry in many ways facilitates these building of relationships between men. Because what it is is that you have high-powered political officials and business elites who are aligning with each other. You need people's signatures for licensing, for permits, for all of these things. For a So for example, a $30 million land development project, you need architects, you need licensing, you need mm -hmm. the land, you need access to land, you need foreign capital. And the foreign capital that was coming from Asia was all cash. Whereas capital coming from the West was primarily, you know, for a $30 million land development project, they would bring, they, the West would say, you know, the U.S., for example, would say, we'll bring in $10 million, but we need, you know, several years to raise the other $20 million. And the South Koreans would come in and say, well, we have the cash, we're ready to go. And so when it's like that, it, you have to build social relationships of trust. Mm -hmm. And the reason why the sex industry is so critical for, for this is because when you're dealing with high-level political officials, the investors want to know that there's going to be a return on their investment. And the way to get that is to have dirt on somebody. And so what you see then in May of 2012, more recently, is this exposure of a high-end prostitution ring because there hasn't been a return on the investment. And so what happens is that you expose, the, you expose men of corruption. And the way to expose men of, corru of corruption is to link them to the sex industry. And so in many ways, the larger book project argues that you cannot understand economic development in rapidly developing societies without understanding the role that the sex industry plays in economic development. That is in the high-end market. And so one of the things that I'm saying about this exoticism, and it links to this question of exoticism, is that I argue that women who cater to Asian businessmen and overseas Vietnamese men construct themselves as pan-Asian modern subjects. So all of them have had plastic surgery. They've had 100% of them have had rhinoplasties, which are nose jobs, and 80% of the women I studied had a double eyelid surgery. This is not to look Western, actually. It's to look like a Korean pop star or a woman from Hong Kong. So the women in the high-end market are creating this sort of new pan-Asian modern subject, whereas women who cater to Western men perform virtuous third world poverty, like I described earlier. And so these two kind of conflicting images very much are about shifting Vietnam's place in the global economy to say that we're a major player in, in the global economy. Well, I don't want to repeat a lot of the things that my fellow uh, panelists have said, but you know, to the point about a model that works, because I, I feel that you really want that one model. Well, <laughs> I, I, I want to embrace you right. know, what you're, but I don't see a good example. Right, because frankly, I don't think there is, I think the point that we're trying to make is that there is no one model of prevention that we know of yet. Mm -hmm. There has been, it's really important that everyone understands that human trafficking has occurred in countries where prostitution is legal and also where it's illegal. So we frankly have not really figured it out as, as a movement, as a global movement. And so I think that's important to point out that so many people are looking for that uh, one solution and it's not, it's multifaceted. What I've learned in my work abroad, in my work here is that um, empowering people, uh, you know, not just survivors, but empowering people and taking a more holistic approach to do so 
is what creates resilience so that people um, so that people don't necessarily fall prey to human trafficking. So I don't know if that really answers your question, but I, I just wanted to point that out. And I also wanted to say that you know now that I'm working in the United States and have been doing so for about a decade on the issue of human trafficking, um, you know, there's definitely, when, when someone says, I'm an abolitionist, that really means I'm trying to abolish prostitution, not abolish modern day slavery. And so that has really changed, <coughs> as I'm speaking to you, Alice, that that has really changed in our landscape. And, you know, I frankly think we should reclaim that term abolition uh, and you know, make sure that we are looking at it from a comprehensive standpoint, that we're not only looking at uh, sex slavery, but looking at empowerment of people. Keep in mind that uh, men all over the world and men here are also trafficked, not just in forced <coughs> labor, but in sex trafficking situations as well. So, like for example, our caseload right now at CAST, uh, about 20 to 25% are actually men and boys. So, you know, you might be surprised that it's so, that's a pretty sizable population. So, I, I again, the, the takeaway I want everyone uh, to have today is not to get swept away with the rhetoric uh, in the media about this issue or things you might read or, you know, what, or even that you overhear. Uh, you really have to think of it uh, as a complicated, multifaceted issue that I think Kimberly really just demonstrated. I can't read, wait to read your book. I mean, it's, that's really, you should all buy her book and, and read it because what she's saying is that this is a highly complicated issue. And as a practitioner, as someone who works directly with survivors, uh, I can attest to that. So thank you. Okay, I got a couple of answers. One is for you, and because I'm an international activist, I work with my colleagues around the world. By colleagues, I mean other sex worker rights activists like myself. And right now, we're looking at New Zealand and some parts of Australia as having one of the better models of decriminalization. We don't want to see legalization. We want to see decriminalization of all consenting adult commercial sex. And we think that just like any other business, as long as we have access to a safe industry where, where the cops are not our adversaries. I remember going to um, Hamburg a number of years ago when I was doing a talk show over there, and I went to the red light district, and there was a police station on the corner of the red light district, and the cops and the hookers hung out. And I'm like, oh my God, like this would never happen over in the United States. And it's like you could walk in that area at late at night and feel perfectly safe. And I think when we take out the adversarial relationship between law enforcement and anybody that's outside the law, for example, homosexuality, um, when you take away that adversarial relationship where we, if we're victims of anything, can go to the police and not fear being arrested ourselves, that's the main issue. Um, you know, people want to take it to, uh, let's arrest your clients. Well, I mean, you're not helping any by taking away the people that pay our rent and make it possible for us to have those jobs or whatever else. What we want is a safe way to work, and that means remove the laws that make <coughs> us criminals, do not criminalize the men who are non-violent, non-coercive, just like you wouldn't go house to house and arrest all husbands in case they might beat up their wives. I mean, you know, that would be stupid. It would also waste a lot of resources, and that's unfortunately what we do. And when you talk about other things that would be, you know, like, well, you know, what about the violence? Um, homosexuality in the United States wasn't that, it wasn't that long ago that it was legalized or decriminalized. And I remember back in the 70s when I was on the LAPD and they had this, you know, oral sex was against the law. And so uh, the law in California was 288A. And I knew a cop that had his license plate 288AAAHH. So, ah, uh, yeah, because every cop I knew committed that felony. They didn't do a very good job, but nevertheless, they were still felons according to the law. I think when, when homosexuality was no longer a crime, you might see hate crimes against them increase. But was it really an increase in hate crimes, or was it now that they could go to the police 
and not get arrested. And that's really what we want to do, is not get arrested when we report crimes against us. I would love it to, to, you know, because I do know a lot of good cops, despite the fact that I see all these rapist cops out there, there's a lot of good cops out there. And what happens is when you have bad laws, you make it impossible for good cops to operate in a safe environment, because if they turn in their fellow officers, you know, their goose is cooked. You're a whistleblower, you're out, you die. Um, and they almost, they almost killed me, but I made it because <laughs> I got too loud and too big and too <laughs> up front there. They couldn't do it. Now, talking about the, um, the thing before uh, the last couple of centuries to your question, I was one of five sex worker activists, that, NGO delegates, that attended the UN conference in Beijing mm -hmm. in 1995. Mm -hmm. There were five of us from around the world. We had, we only known of each other. We hadn't met each other, but we ended up going there. And for two weeks, we lobbied the, the um, government delegates. There was a paragraph that said, in essence, all pornography and prostitution are incompatible with the dignity and worth of the human person and must be eliminated. We lobbied for two weeks. We changed that paragraph by one word, all forced prostitution and pornography. We were so proud of that achievement. You have no idea what we went through to get that happen. When we got back, then we found out that people like Melissa Farley and her ilk said, there's no difference between forced and free choice. There's no difference between child and adult. And I'm like, really? Do you know, I mean, I'm 62 years old, and, and many years ago, when we looked at when women you know, turned in their rapists or their, their violent husbands, they were not believed. And they worked so hard to change that so that they would be believed. And it's like, okay, now you're saying, well, we should believe a woman when she says she's raped, which she should, but we can't believe her when she says she's not. How stupid is that? Excuse me, I didn't want to swear again, but I mean, that's the most ignorant thing. Now, as far as the pornography, I was involved in that too in the 80s after I got arrested. My husband and I decided to file a lawsuit in California State Court and joining the district attorney from using the pandering pimping laws against people who made adult porn. It was at the same time as Hal Freeman. He, he filed his case first. I, uh, my case was filed by Stanley Fleischman, a, excuse me, a First Amendment attorney. And what we said is the things that I learned as a sex worker, I would like to teach other women how to do. Because you know what? There really is a skill and an art to pleasing a man or a woman. And I, I had couples as well as just you know women as clients. And there was a lot of things that I learned that I could share with other people. I wanted to turn this into videos, but unfortunately, according to the law, I would be charged with pornography, uh, you know, pandering and pimping. Um, so what happened is, of course, the Hal Freeman decision came up and said, the judge said, well, it may be prostitution, but because it's a third party that's the end person for, you know, recipient for this pornography, then it's still protected free speech. So that's when the split happened between the porn people and the you know, prostitution. So a lot of the early sex worker rights <coughs> activists that I've known, Annie Sprinkle and Neil Hartley and all of them, they're very um, pro-prostitution mm -hmm. rights as well. Unfortunately, the newer, younger uh, chicks, <laughs> if you will, and porn stars, um, they don't recognize that they're prostitutes too. They go, oh, I'm not a whore, I'm a porn star. <coughs> You know, and it's really, really difficult because the older, us old whores, and that's a wonderful book I'm working on, it's called Old Whores and Aging Porn Stars, the first person uh, <laughs> accounts of the sex worker rights movement in America. And us old whores and the, the aging porn stars, we know what it was like back then, and, and we fought so hard, just like fighting for a woman to get recognized that she is a victim of rape or domestic violence and not be left out of the police station when that happens. Okay, um, we have time for one more round. I haven't gotten the site yet, so absolutely, I, I totally have you. And I just have to say, Regina, we actually met in '95. We were, I was in Beijing, and I was working were you, were with you? the five of you. Oh my God! So yes, it was amazing. Yes. So like, anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so yes, please. Um, so we've been talking a lot about nuance, and Norma started touching on something that we've been talking about sex work as if it's equivalent to prostitution, when it's much broader. It does include porn and stripping and fetish work. And phone sex work. And phone sex work. And I would actually 
disagree with you about some of the younger porn stars. There's a lot of them in the sex workers' rights movement, even here in LA. Um, but we've also, as much as we've been talking about nuance, we've sort of accepted this binary that there is empowered sex workers mm -hmm. and then coerced sex workers, which leaves out, I uh, actually would venture to say, like 95% of sex workers. Because you can get into sex work consensually and then face coercion. Um, you can also be a victim of exploitation and still feel empowered and have agency as a person. Um, so we've been touching on nuance, but still kind of working within this binary. So as we're working through that and the super complex relationships with politics and economies and global economies, my question's actually about what would be an economic or social change that's not maybe not a policy directly related to either sex work or trafficking, but just in terms of labor and in terms of mm -hmm. community building, what would be an economic goal that we could work towards? Okay. Any other questions over here? Uh, all right, so I will now open it to the parts that already had spoken. Yes, please. Um, I know Kay touched on this very briefly, that we have this overarching view of sex work and sex trafficking victims as just women. But in all of your research, have you have you all seen um, significant inf um, significant numbers of young males and um, young boys being trafficked in for sex? And if you um, do, you think that these numbers are significant enough for us to dedicate um, more time and more <coughs> efforts into um, bringing in more complete? Um, complete work and assistance for both male and female sex work, sex workers. <coughs> um, okay, and I did you want did you want to take that? Okay, great. Um, so my last question then is just kind of going down the panel is just you know th there's a lot that's on the table, right? There's a lot of different things that we're talking about, and if you had to really prioritize and really talk about kind of what you consider to be kind of the priority issues for the next decade. And if we were to have this conference 10 years from now, we talked about historically things have moved. 10 years from now, what are really priority issues moving forward? Hey, I'm going to start. You want to start? We'll do it on this side again. Okay. Okay, okay. Oh, gosh. That's <laughs> you want to start with that one? I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, I wonder if I could just uh, quickly uh, go to Alice and maybe she's not here. Um, actually, the previous question, and I tie it into this. So the question of, of feminism and uh, sort of feminist uh, stakes in, in the issue, and then, and then getting to your question about the dichotomy. Um, so I, I really appreciate your, your, question, your, your comment about how there was this feminist sex war, um, and a lot of that sex war uh, was around this issue of coercion versus exploitation, and that was actually the title of my uh, master's thesis, is, is it exploitative if I like it? I mean, so this was mid-1990s, and we were fighting and fighting and fighting, and it was just a, a fight that you could never win. Um, and the, the bigger question then is uh, what thing, something I would like to have, and I've been arguing this for about 20 years, is to think about the continuum and to think about why it is that we only think about this sort of coercion versus choice or empowerment versus slavery within the context of, mostly within the context of sex work um, and not so much in the context <coughs> of marriage or not so much in the context of other kinds of labor. Um, but so just thinking about, you know, would you, would you ever ask a, a wife or a husband, um, are, are you an empowered husband or an exploited husband or, or a slave husband or, you know? And so, I mean, it just becomes ridiculous when you, when you apply it to other institutions. And so I think it's also ridiculous to apply it to this institution. It's, it's another form of human activity. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why there tends to be a lot of exploitation in this form of activity. Um, but uh, so anyway, that's just part of um, what I was thinking about when, with your question. I also just want to briefly go back to the issue of, of slavery and, and my my presentation, which is about thinking about new metaphors and new stories and new terms. Um, slavery is, is an incredibly gut 
uh, wrenching term. It's not a neutral term, nor should it be. Um, and I'm very curious about um, what the historian of slavery, Orlando Patterson, has to say about about the sort of invoking of uh, the slavery metaphor, maybe in your in your final plenary, because I think it's um, I personally find it highly problematic for many reasons. One reason is that. Well, I think you, you hopefully will be able to speak to this, but in terms of thinking about labor that's exploitation, I just had a big fight with Kevin Bayless about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of labor exploitation, if we if we're all only thinking about rescuing slaves or thinking about modern day slavery, then where does that leave the rest of us? <laughs> There's a lot of exploitation, a lot of abuse that happens that cannot be condensed into slavery. Uh, that is more in terms of the continuum of coercion and exploitation and just bad living conditions. Um, and you can't rest, can you rescue people out of bad living conditions? There's a lot of bad living conditions in this neighborhood right off of campus. Mm -hmm. Are they slaves? No, but that doesn't mean we are not, you know, we don't have to do something about it, yes. And so that's, that's where I keep um, arguing and I hope that 10 years from now when we have a conference that we're not talking about the dichotomies anymore. We're actually talking about real social justice initiatives, maybe that term won't even be used anymore because um, the right is, co is um, you know, co-opting that term now as well, as, as well as human rights. But thinking about things in terms of structural interventions as opposed to personal morality interventions, that's my hope. Yeah. Um, thank you for that question, Sophia. I think it's a great one. And I, I guess, <coughs> For me to prioritize one thing, it would be the way research is conducted on this issue and, and um, really on issues pertaining to women uh, all over the world. But um, I think conducting research in a more participatory manner versus a sort of top-down positivist approach um, is, is essential if we really want to, um, want to advance social justice aims. Um, dissolving the sort of binary between us versus them, not only from the West and the developing world, but also the academy versus the people, um, I think is a, another really essential goal. Um, to answer the question in the back about this division between force and coercion, I think that Vercel Freñez, who actually organized this whole conference, um, has this has a really great way of thinking about this on a continuum, which is, to, and it's actually building a lot of what Randall Patterson is theorizing of, but to think about indentured mobility, which is that when women consent to entering into, and she's looking at hostess workers, Filipino women, in getting entertainment visas to go to Japan, they consent to migrate abroad and then get caught up in these kinds of systems. If you break it down and think about their labor process and the migration process, you begin to unpack these kind of exploitive working conditions at, in their sort of indentured mobility. And I think that her book, Illicit Flirtations, does a really great job of, of breaking this down and thinking about it less in terms of dichotomies. And, and I think there's lots of work, actually, that's come out in the last year or so that moves beyond these dichotomies. Um, and in terms of thinking about you know, where we'd like, where I would hope to we, that we go in 10 years from now, I think I would hope that the heroes of, of this trafficking movement, namely like the Nicholas Kristofs, Kevin Bales, who who become famous and and you know request enormous speaker fees for their talks, sixty thousand dollars is Nicholas Kristofs' number, right? Like and who have made a name up for it for themselves of being heroes. I hope that they they they're kind of that they're that they sort of dissolve. Um, and, and I think that, and it's not just those figures, I mean, it's easy to pick on them, but I think, you know, there are tons of people who work in development work who are fed fat, who are fat cows, right? Like, we know this. And I, I joke, I teach a class on social justice, and I joke to my students, if your parents think that you going into sociology means that you're going to be broke, you're kidding me. Because just go work in development work. There, you know, you get paid expat salaries. You live a quite, a, you know, nice life doing this kind, doing this, this kind of work. And I think the work that you know Kay is doing is really important. And and thinking about the kinds of compl complex relationships that emerge for people who've been doing this for ten years or so, and re recognize the complexity of these types of questions. The other thing I wanted to say is that um, part of what we're doing. Um, with this conference is Marcel and I are actually working on an edited volume um, that was commissioned by Open Society, which sort of spurred this conference. And the, that volume, I think, is titled Human Trafficking Reconsidered Labor and Migration. And it really begins to interrogate these, I, these questions around labor 
and migration. And I think that is the direction I hope we begin to move move towards instead of having these sort of silly kind of debates of, and these and, and, and bringing out bringing up new sort of myths and stories to circulate a much more complex image. And I think this sort of musical last night does a great job of doing this, of creating these new cultural sort of ways of thinking about sex trafficking. Um, okay, so I will, since I mentioned uh, our statistic about men and boys, I'll, I'll talk about that. Um, I do think we, we need to allocate resources and, um, and dialogue to this issue, because again, the landscape has changed so much, um, particularly in this country, where really men and boys um, aren't really perceived as, as victims or as survivors. And I'll, I'll give you just an example, because I think that really helps hit home these types of statements that I'm making. And you know, we had an 18-year-old um, male who needed shelter, and we, you know, our shelter houses uh, women and girls. There is no shelter for male survivors of human trafficking. And so we placed him in a shelter on Skid Row, really good program, but he woke up one morning, went outside, and someone had been murdered right outside of the shelter. Honestly, from a, uh, from a mental health treatment standpoint, that put him back so far it, it was just in incredible. And so it really, it really taught us a big lesson as an organization that by having all of these you know, lenses and frameworks, and, and it's important that we talk about it in our dialogue, of course, I don't mean to say that it's not, but we have to think through the complexities, as I said before, of this issue. I mean, I'm telling you, 20 to 25 percent of our caseload are men and boys, and there's no shelter in this country for them, and no, you know, services that are really uniquely designed to help them. And not that I don't think a gender lens should be used on this issue. I, I think there's merit to that. As a feminist, I, I say that. But at the same time, I think that a human rights lens is more appropriate uh, because for that reason, for the question that you posed. So in terms of uh, the nuances, because I think that's an excellent question, and you're absolutely right that we learn so much from our clients um, about these nuances each and every day, and yet the policies we create, and that trickles down to practices, right? They don't reflect that, that's the problem. So what I want to see in the next 10 years is, one, more survivors uh, at the table, um, you know, I would love to be able to, uh, in fact, uh, we did this strategic planning process uh, a few years ago, and some of the survivors who went through our program and were part of the planning of the organization now, um, you know, they envision themselves to be policymakers in, in the future. And so that's what I want to see. I want to see opportunities open up where it's not sewing in a factory or that traditional uh, work, but you know, doing what their goals really are. And as a civil, members of civil society, our job is to provide that environment for them to do so. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, real quickly, what I'd like to see in the next 10 years is that we decriminalize all consenting adult commercial sex. That needs to happen so that we can stop being victimized by those who are entrusted to protect us. That would be the cops. Okay, the second thing is that we call people like Nicholas Kristoff, um, we call them victim pimps, because that's what they do. That's how they make their money off of prostitutes, is by making us victims, and I'm sick of being a, a pimped by Kristoff. Um, the final thing I'd like to tell you about is we were talking about some uh, <coughs> research. Back in 1985, a uh, number of the sex workers that I've been involved with were working with uh, Dr. Diana Prince. She was working on her dissertation back then, and she uh, did a study of 450 California and Nevada prostitutes, and nobody would publish her book. I mean, she came out with this fabulous material. I have her original material at home, um, and nobody would publish it. It was just too politically incorrect. Well, she just called me day before yesterday, and said she retired from her job, you know, she's a sociologist, and she retired from her job, took her pension money, and had the book published. It is now available on Amazon. 
Um, you can look up, I think it's called Secret Lives, Real Lives of Sex Workers, but look up for Dr. Diana Prince for her book, and it's got all kinds of research that she conducted that never got out there that would completely blow away Melissa Farley's BS about sex workers. And finally, I want to talk about the stuff with Aaron and sex workers. One of the reasons I started ISFACE, International Sex Worker Foundation for Art, Culture, and Education, is because I think it's really important to include the community in, in events that sex workers put on. Carol Lee, for example, does the, um, every two years, the Sex Worker Film and Art Festival. Um, we were involved in, in up in Butte, Montana with the Dumas Brothel Project that we wanted to restore as a, as a museum. And we wanted to have every year a horror camp. And that would be where we would have sex workers from around the world come and interact with the community, not, not sexually, but just with their culture, with their ideas, with their families. It would be a way for, for you know, sex workers in, in developing countries to come to America, to the Old West. Um, unfortunately, the people up in view, uh, who were first very welcoming, decided they didn't want a bunch of new whores in town, regardless of what our plan was, so um, that was next. But I really think it's important we started to do another uh, art festival called the Fille de Joie. Unfortunately, that also got nixed because people are afraid of whores. But I think it's a really important thing to involve the community in a non-threatening environment to get to know us as human beings. Thank you. And can everybody join me in thanking our phenomenal Everyone, please, if you have a moment, late, either now or later, fill out the evaluation of the panel. We'd greatly appreciate it.